Get everything. Really? How you doing? That's good. It's good to be back. I actually enjoy coming here. It's um, it's kind of my safe place, really, because uh, you know, let me let me just pray. Father, I pray that your word tonight would. Father, we just want revelation. We 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 want to hear your heart, your word for us. We love your word, but Father, we want it to be Rhema. We want it to be alive and living and. Uh, and prophetic today. So Lord, bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I think there's a change going down. I, I really do. I, I think that um, uh, I, I think that the church is in a place of reformation right now. And uh, a lot of us don't really know what's going on. And um, in fact, I don't think anybody does except God, the Holy, you know, the Holy Spirit's <laughs> got it figured out. And we're just trying to interpret it as we go. So I love coming here. I said to Sharon today, I like going over to Grown Faith Church because it's kind of a safe place. I can, I can try out you know everything I feel like God is saying, and, and you guys still love me, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> but I, I do. I, I think that there's a shift going on, and I think for churches like Growing Faith, like where you guys are at today, I just think it's really exciting uh, because you haven't been around that long. You know what I'm saying? And big ships take a, a while to turn, but you're in that position where where God can do something fresh and you can turn quickly. Uh, I, I've shared a little bit with you guys. You might know my story. Um, you know, about 10 years ago, uh, um, around 2010, God spoke to us uh, from Acts 13, 46 and said, from now on, turn to the Gentiles. And I didn't really know what that was all about. And, and, and you know, God has been gracious with us over the last, especially last seven years. Uh, you, you, most of you know, and I'm just going to just double up a little bit, so please forgive me. Uh, God connected us in with Waterman Business Centres for a few years, and, and really that was about figuring out how Jesus would mentor small business people. Small, not small as in, you know what I mean. Um, I'm a small business person, you know, because I'm small, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm getting smaller too. I'm working hard, going to the gym, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we did that for a while, and we, we're trying to figure out, because... Like for me, it was like walking out of one room and into another. Uh, I, I was in a place where I'd been a pastor for 25 years. I was on our national leadership team. I was, my world was the church and, and, and all my connections, my friends, my relationships. And it was like overnight, this massive burnout, especially that my wife went through. And we just walked out. And, and it was like we went from, from a church bubble to a marketplace and figuring out, well, what does this look like? And, and so I felt this thing of God calling me to the Gentiles. So we did that thing in Waterman for a few years and walked with Neville. And Neville's such an incredible man of God. Honestly, just a real faith guy. And we're trying to figure out, you know, I remember, um, I, how many know Neville Waterman? Anybody know Neville Waterman? He owns Waterman Business Centers. And, um, and we'd, be, we'd be trying to, we'd be praying and, and planning and, and Neville would come in, Graham, Graham, you know why we do this? You know why we do this? Because people matter to God, you know. This is great, you know. And, and like we're on the outside, we're, 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 I guess, speaking business language and secular, and we weren't, you know, singing praise and worship before every meeting we had. Um, but on the inside, we were trying to say, well, how would Jesus minister and love business people? Uh, and then that season came to an end, and we went over to to uh, Albury and my wife started a Pilates business, reached Pilates studio. And, and again, we're trying to figure out the same thing. It's like our, our church world that we, that we had been part of, almost that bubble, now we're in the marketplace. And so, well, what does it, what does it mean to take a, you know, a few hundred unbelievers or mostly unbelievers and be Jesus to them? What, what, would, what would a Pilates business look like as a church for unsaved people? So we've been going through that for a few years, and that was kind of interesting. Then, then COVID hit, you know, it closed the doors. So I went and worked for Metricon Homes for a couple of years. And, uh, and honestly, I tell you what, goodness me, talk about living. You know, you know, a lot of stuff, we've been in an environment where I guess we've been able to control kingdom culture. Yep. Then, then you get thrown into a place, this ain't kingdom culture. <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, I'm trying to sell some things that I wouldn't buy myself. You know, how do you figure that one out, you know? And, uh, and, and so I had to, again, figure out how do you, because you see, I, when I left the church, when, when God called me out, the gift didn't fall off me. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The calling didn't fall off me. It came with me. Yeah, come on. So, come on. so now I'm a pastor at Metricon. <laughs> and I try to figure all that out and, and trying to be Jesus in this environment. And, and I've got to be honest, all this to me was just like brand new. Uh, and, and it was kind of like, I didn't know how to do this stuff, but I was a pastor, but I was no longer in the church. And, and, and to be really honest with you, when, when we left the ministry, now you, you guys will never understand any of this stuff, because, <laughs> but, but we got thrown out of it, <laughs> you know. Um, we were popular. It was almost, I felt, I remember saying to my wife one day, we'd been through a really terrible time, and it wasn't just in ministry, but my family and my dad, and he went to prison and threw it off, just a mess. But I said to Sharon one day, I said, you know, I feel like we're on the boat heading away from Nineveh. And this storm that's hitting us is so big that if they don't throw us overboard, we're all going to drown. And I felt like for me to leave the church, it was like being thrown overboard and, you know, into the belly of a whale so that the storm would stop because it was, God, it was like God saying, I need you out of this environment. And, and some people didn't understand the direction I was going. They didn't understand. It was almost like we felt alone. We were outcasts. And uh, so, so here we were in this new world trying to pioneer what does it mean to turn to the Gentiles? So it was the only word God gave us. Uh, after Metricon, I met this, this guy. Well, I'd, I've been building a relationship with this guy called Rick Leeworthy, and he owns uh, a growing, you know, Rick too, don't you? And uh, called Hadar Homes. And, uh, and God gave me a word. I shared with you last week. God gave me a word that, he was going, that, that I was to connect. And uh, so eventually I asked, I said to him, mate, I'll, I'll come and work for you. I said, I was at that time with Metricon. The way that, that Metricon works with their salespeople is that you make sales... And then you get paid when it hits contract. So I'd made heaps of sales that I wouldn't get paid until contract. It was about $80,000. And God called me to leave. Now, if you leave before contract, you'll lose it all. And God spoke to me. And I, I went to Rick and I said, Rick, I've got to be honest with you. I just feel like I need to walk away. It, cost me, it ended up costing me about $60,000 to leave. And, uh, but God spoke to me, and I said to him, mate, I'll come and work for you. I said, I'll do the most, ba I'll, just, I'll just start at the bottom. I said, in fact, give me a trailer, and I'll go around all your work sites and just pick up rubbish. So if that would help you, and pay me minimum wage and, and stuff like that. So, but God gave me a word that, that this turning to the Gentiles was somehow going to be connected to his business. Now, a now whole long story later, but... You know, we, we, we're over there now. Obviously, I'm no longer running around with the trailer, which he never asked me to do. He asked me to be a host and really for his salespeople. And, and now I'm, I'm their people and development manager and whatever, you know. But, but here's, here's the thing. I, I thought at that time that God had called me to turn to the Gentiles. I thought that God was saying, Graham, I'm going to take you out of ministry, out of the church, out of the bubble, and I'm going to put you into the marketplace. I'm going to see how you go being Jesus outside the four walls, being a minister of reconciliation, an ambassador of faith in the marketplace. That's what I thought was happening until this year. And now I'm sitting here thinking, whoa, God's doing something new and he's bringing a word to the local church and he's saying from now on, you're going to turn to the Gentiles. I mean, I'm not saying God sent COVID, but he locked the doors of the church. Yeah. How more obvious does it get? <laughs> Guys, I'm going to ask you now to be people of faith amongst the Gentiles. And, and just like for me, unless a storm came and I got thrown out of the boat, I wouldn't have left. Honestly, if God didn't lock the doors of the church, you would have kept coming. <laughs> So, so, so God began to do this new thing for the church and say, let's just see how you guys go living out your faith beyond the walls of the church. That's good. From uh, now on, you turn to the Gentiles. Now, now here's a thought, and I want to be really, really uh, sensitive when I say this. But things are not happy at Hillsong right now. They, they really aren't. And, and, and my heart breaks for that. And... And, and 
I, I've, I've been involved in that world. In fact, when I was a young youth pastor in, a, in, a, in a quite a large church, um, I was my, my friend, my peers, you know, were, were Brian Houston was a youth pastor for his dad. I was a youth pastor for a guy called Jim Williams. And Danny Gugliamucci was a youth pastor for Andrew Evans. And Mel Fletcher was leading Youth Alive. And I was, you know, involved in leading Youth Alive in New Zealand. And, and, and we were part 40 years ago of what I think was a reformation. I think God did something. He, I, I don't know if you, I, I, I guess I've been around a long time. I'm not feeling that old, but I must be. I must be. Because I was, I was around before that kind of Hillsong Youth Alive contemporary thing took place, uh, when you'd have the elders on the stage in the grey suits. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? The Pentecostal two step? You know? And. Uh, Charismatic it was like, and, and there was this, there was a shift back then, that that came with with contemporary church, concert style worship, com, you know, large crowds, and 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 listen, a lot of really cool things took place in that time. Um, people, people got uh, really, honestly, there's been a lot of people saved and a lot of people blessed through the last 40 years of what has become a very much a contemporary concert music kind of a thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, the flip side of that is all our young people started to think, man, if you want to be somebody in the kingdom of God, you need to be up here. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? And, 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 and the goal of young people, began, if you want to minister, man, you need to become the, the preacher of the big church and the big crowd. And, and you need to be the guitar player, you know, and, or the worship leader. And we, we created this, this new world where, where um, it, it, it's become a little bit of a bubble. And, and we've got this, this world right now where evangelism actually takes place inside the church. We don't necessarily say it, but preachers say, you bring them in, I'll get them saved. Do I see a hand? You know what I'm saying? That, that, that takes place inside the church and, and, and healing and miracles and signs and wonders takes place inside the church. You know, uh, think Benny Hinn, concerts and, 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 and you know, events. Uh, discipleship takes place inside the church. Our... our our friends tend to be church people. Most of, of the friends, you know, you know what I'm saying? Our social network is all inside the church. And, and this, this huge thing has, has come to pass where we created megastars and put them on a pedestal upon which they would inevitably fall. Of course. Yep. Of course. Inevitable. Now, I'm not making any excuses, and, 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 you know, as I say, Brian is a friend of mine, and he has been open and honest about his failures and that he's made mistakes. But, but this, this incredible move of God that we've seen after, over the last 40 years has created this downside, and we're in a situation right now where I think prophetically God is calling time. Yeah. Yeah. And he's not saying, Brian, bad person, or or Benny Hinn, bad person, or anything like that. It's just that it had a season. Every light cast a shadow. And, and, and right now, it's almost like God is... Here's, here's the deal. The problem is that the way that we started to do Christianity over the last decades, possibly even more than this previous season, doesn't look like the way Jesus did life. Yeah. It doesn't. It, it doesn't reflect it at all. I mean, all this healing inside the walls of the church, for goodness sake, Jesus healed people on the streets and, and, and at wells and, and, and at waters, you know, pools. He'd go to the pools, people hanging around, he'd raise people up and, and he'd hang out in pubs and clubs and sinners and, and Jesus' friends weren't all Christians. It, it's almost like... Like, like Jesus, Jesus had this world, I just think he turned to the Gentiles. He lived his life amongst the Gentiles. That, this, now, now let me just say this, the shift that God's got going on right now 
He's not closing down this. It's not a dismantling of the church. It's just a recognition that the kingdom is a lot bigger than this. Come on. He's just making things a lot bigger. In fact, this is just the dressing room before the game. You know, where the coach gets up and talks about, hey, now this is your position and that's your skill. And I, you get on that paddock today, I need you to be doing this. And you're over here, man, you just, you, man, you just pass that ball. Man, you just pass that ball. There's an old, how many know a lot about rugby? Just pass the ball to Jonah. <laughs> pass it to Jonah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a great game plan back in those days. But, uh, but, yeah, but, but this is just the change. So, so God is beginning to say, you know, when our whole world becomes inside the church bubble and, and it's all happening inside, I think God is just saying it's enough. It's time. There's a new day coming. And, and the cool thing for me is that God is calling the church to, gent to, to, to turn to the Gentiles. And I've been practicing for seven years. I've been experimenting. I've been out there. So this is kind of cool for me because I'm thinking, well, we're all, in the, we're all being thrown out of the boat now. It's just a new day. Yeah. It really is a new day. And, uh, and, and you know, there, there's, let me just talk about the scriptures. Let's, let's go to the Bible. Back in John chapter 5, Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath, right? And, and he was really unpopular. And uh, in fact, the religious people wanted to kill him. And he speaks these, these words to the, to the religious people. And he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Think about that. Jesus saying to the, 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 sorry, the Pharisees, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you'll have eternal life. Think about it. Sean, you seem to be a guy to me that is so in love with the Word of God that you're just diligently seeking them and you really believe that in those words you'll find eternal life. You see, sometimes we come to the Scripture with these preconceived ideas. Well, that must have, Jesus was telling the Pharisees off. It's not a bad thing to be told that you study the Scriptures diligently and look, you're looking for eternal life, right? <laughs> It's really good stuff, man. I mean, they're probably thinking, well, thank you, Jesus. You've, you've, at least you're complimenting us now. <laughs> the, the, the problem was, he, he then went on, he said, but these scriptures that you study, they're actually pointing to me. <laughs> they're pointing to me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. Yeah. Now, now I, I want you to think about this. What would Jesus say to us today? He was saying to the, to the disciples, uh, the, the Pharisees, he was saying, you guys, you are studying the scriptures, but you don't realize that the scriptures are a signpost to me, to a person. And, and if you could just get beyond the signpost, you would find the destination is life. Now, now think about this when you look at that scripture. He was saying to the disciples, when you study the scriptures, you're hoping you'll find eternal life. But if you realize that they point to me, you would find life. So it's like he's saying to the, the Pharisees, he's saying to the religious people, you're so busy studying the scriptures because you're looking for future eternal life. But if you had some kind of understanding that the scriptures that you're studying are a signpost to me, you wouldn't be just getting eternal life. You'd be getting life that, that springs eternal. So, so what would Jesus... Say to this generation, I think he would say this. You guys love church. You love the worship. You love the events. You love the preaching. You love the whole, the whole thing. And, and, and it's really amazing. But you think that in this, you'll find eternal life. But you need to understand that this is actually a signpost yeah. to something else. You see, the, the church doesn't bring eternal life. Sure. Jesus does. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus does. Now, 
Jesus loves the church, but the church ain't Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm going somewhere here. Church is actually the pointer to something else. To someone else. And that's why I think God is saying, I'm going to shift things right now because listen to this. This is original. This, this is original. <laughs> I am tired of a church-centered faith. Come on. I think I'd rather have a faith-centered church. Yep. Woo. Yes. That is the shift. That's what's going down right now, is that God is saying, I'm going to do a new thing and I'm going to thrust you out to the Gentiles because I need you to be a faith-filled person. I need you to be a Jesus person out there beyond the walls of the church because if you get so enamored and so in love with the four walls, you're going to get so comfortable that all of a sudden all your friends are not sinners, they're saints. And all the miracles aren't happening out there they're happening in here. Oh, I, I, I gotta be, I gotta be really careful, man. I can say some things right now. I'm tired of healing Christians. Come on, we should be walking in divine health. <laughs> I mean, thank God we get healed, but we kind of expect it. Out there, they don't. Shock, horror. I'm feeling pretty good right now. So, so Jesus is trying to get us to have this. I'm telling you right now, there is a reformation taking part in the church where God is not dismantling this. He's just helping us understand that it's bigger than this. And I honestly, I went through a season of time. I'm going to be really careful what I say. It's been recorded, but hey. Well, I, I could hardly even go to church because my wife got so damaged in the ministry that she'd have an anxiety attack every time she walked in. So I had to make a choice. Am I going to leave my wife at home and go to church on a Sunday morning? Or am I going to stay home and take my wife out for brunch on a Sunday morning and minister to her and pray for her and help her recover? Now, the reality is I had to stop worrying about what people thought of me because I was the executive member, the preacher, the, the whole deal. Now I was nobody. But I, I had to almost forgo my reputation and be Jesus in the market. We just felt so alone. Amen. We felt so alone. And, and I, you know, I went from preaching lots of places to preaching no places because I wasn't attending the local church because I was ministering to my wife. Now I'm attending as much as I can now. But you know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes we just have to get beyond that this... Yeah, exactly. So right now, right now, let me, let me just tell you what's, what's happening right now. A whole bunch of people closely associated with Hillsong are going to have their faith challenged. Yeah. There'll be people that will stop following Jesus. Think about it. There'll be people that will stop following Jesus because of how disappointed they are what's happening with the church that they love. Now, I got saved in a in a mega church. It had probably 2,000 people in a city of about 100,000. And uh, mega pastor, signs and wonders, a whole deal. And, uh, and then the day came that we found that he had had a moral failure, several moral failures. And a lot of people left the church and a lot of people left the faith. And I remember somebody saying to me one day, said, Graham, how did you stay with, with Jesus? How did you stay faithful to Christ? And I, I said, look, I'm going to be really honest with you. I didn't even understand the question. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. The church was just a signpost to someone else. Yeah. Jesus never had an affair. Yeah. Why would I leave him? Yeah. What, are you, what are you saying? Well, I would leave the faith because a human being that I foolishly put on a pedestal fell. Why, what, what, are you, what are you on about? When you, when you allow your faith to be affected because of what happens in a church, you have a church-centered faith. You have a church-centered faith. I never even thought about backsliding. 
Maybe a few other things have challenged me along the way, but not that. <laughs> not the church. Not the imperfect, flawed organization that men are putting together and women are putting together to try and represent the kingdom. I mean, I haven't been to the perfect church yet. And if, if you arrive at one, please leave because you'll ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> Be because the, the reformation that's going on right now is a call back to a revelation that Jesus is the Christ yeah. Yeah. and that he's called us to live out our faith amongst the Gentiles, not to lock ourselves inside four walls every Sunday and have all the miracles and all the word and all the discipleship and all the good stuff happening on a Sunday and not on Monday. We've got to learn how to walk into the marketplace and be Jesus. Walk in the marketplace and see, see, see Matthew 16. Jesus is talking to the disciples. And, you know, who do people say that I am? You know the story. Oh, well, you're this prophet or that prophet or whatever. Yeah, well, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered in verse 16, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Christ. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell, gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. Now Jesus wasn't saying that Peter was the rock. You know, a lot of, the scripture's been interpreted that way a lot, that Jesus was that saying, look, upon, you're, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The rock was the revelation flesh and blood didn't you're the Christ you're the son of the living God Jesus bypassed the Pharisees bypassed religion bypassed the temple with a personal revelation Peter saying you're the Christ the son of the living God and Jesus said you know what that revelation that's the rock upon which I build the church that's good, right? and when the church is a faith centered church not a church centered faith not even the gates of hell could prevail against it. Come on. Not even the gates of hell. So, so this reformation that's going on, in my view, is, is not a dismantling of the local church. I want to be really clear about that. But it's a shift of emphasis that the church is a signpost to Christ and that our faith and our walk and our marriages and our workplace and our friendships and our ministry and everything is based on a relationship with Christ. And tell you, tell you what, the local church could go to hell in a handbasket by getting things so wrong. It would not affect my faith. Yeah, come yeah. on. Go That's right. right. That's it. Come on. Because my faith is built on a revelation of Christ. Now, now... The, this, this shift is going on right now where God is calling us to a walk of, of such revelation and such faith. And I, I built my whole world on this. I, I live by five questions. I don't know if I shared that with you last week and yeah, the journaling that I do. But I did mention this verse last time I was here. When I say last week. That's how long it seems like to me. It was a couple of months ago probably. Uh, John 5, 19. Jesus said, this is, this is what Jesus said. Let me just show you how I live my life. He said, I, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus. Get personal. Tell you one thing. This is what, tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. What was Jesus saying? He said, I, I've actually centered my faith around a relationship with my father so much that I get up every day and I walk through my world trying to see what the father's doing and I try and echo that. I try and do that. I've got to tell you, if, if that was what church was, if we had a revelation that that's what church is, I tell you, the world would, the, the world would be changed in a heartbeat. Because what would be happening? So well, what, what did you do for church today? Come on. Well, I got up and I had my, my quiet time and I said, God, what are you going to be doing today? What do I need to see? 
I had this, this vision of one of my workmates and, and I had this kind of, this real sense that he, he's been complaining about a bad ankle. I had this real sense that I, I prayed for him and he got healed. So I went to work, sure enough, he's limping in. And I thought, mate, you know I'm a Christian. You might think I'm a bit weird, but I kind of believe in prayer. How, how about I pray for your ankle? And I prayed for him and he got healed. Fantastic. Next morning you get up, God, what do I need to see today? What do I need to hear today? What do I need to do today? Well, you know, um, you know this, this couple, they're, they're actually at work, they're having this affair, and he's married to her, but she's, you know, and, and God begins to show you some stuff, and you think, well, okay, well, how, give me some wisdom on that one, you know? And, and you see, when we turn to the Gentiles, it's literally learning how to live a life that is so connected to our Heavenly Father through Jesus, that it's this constant revelation. Oh, I'm just only going to do what I see the Father doing. You know, God spoke to me about this business, Hate Our Homes, and said, go and work there. So when you hear Rick tell the story, I started calling Rick and saying, uh, mate, we need to have coffee. He had no idea who I was. And he kept putting me off. But, but he said, God had spoken. I was going to... I was going to work with this guy. I was going to serve him. I was going to help him. No, no, Rick, let's have a coffee eventually. But you see, it came because God showed me that's where I need to be. And, and I, just, I just feel like this, this whole thing, and, and you know, a lot of the things that, that I've walked through in the last seven years have been unpopular with my old friends in ministry. Someone would say to me, oh, so sad, Grant, man, to hear you out of ministry. Who told you that? Well, you're not pastoring anymore. Then. Who told you that? <laughs> pastoring? In fact, I reckon I'm pastoring more people today than I used to. Come on, <laughs> come on. Go. There we go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to really Good. encourage you today Good. that there's the shift going on. <clears throat> Good thing I put this on. The shift going on where, where God is, is changing the church from being a church-centered faith to a faith-centered church. Where, and look, I, can I just say this? Don't judge anybody if they have a mega church and big concert up the front and a big band and, and a superstar pastor. Because you see, what, what, what we can do is we can so I said, that's, that's over, we criticize the mega church. No. That's what God's told that guy to do. I'm not going to question it. He gets up every morning and says, Father, what do I need to see? And the Father says, I, you need to see 2,000 people in church on Sunday. I'm not going to... we just got to stop arguing with what people are hearing from God. Yeah. Yes. All I'm saying is it's actually a lot bigger than that. Come on. God can do anything. There, there's a couple of scriptures I'd, I'd love to share with you. I'm going to. I've got one minute and 42 seconds to go. It's the story of two kings. I'm going to be really brief. I'm not going to read the whole passage to you. But 1 Samuel 13, it's, it's about Saul. You, you, you know the story, how, how Saul was, um, had his army and the Amalekites were coming. And uh, God had spoke to Saul and said, now don't go into battle yep. until the priest has sacrificed. Right? You know the story? Yeah. And, 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 and uh, so... The battle's coming and, and, and Samuel had stopped off at Macca's and he was late and, and, and this whole thing was going down. Have I shared this with you before? And, uh, and he panics. He, he thinks, I, I can't wait for the priest to come. Now in those days, you communicated with God through the priest. Jesus hadn't come yet, right? So that was how it was to be done. And, and Saul's thinking, you know what, I can't go into battle uh, until we're sacrificed, but I can't wait for the priest to sacrifice, and everybody's in my army are melting away in fear. I'm just going to do it myself and go. I'm going to do it myself and go. I'm not going to get heaven on board before I go on earth. I'm just going to bypass that heaven part, and I'm going to go into battle. And of course, he starts to go into battle, and, and then Samuel turns up. He says, what have you done? He said, well, I wanted to wait for God to speak. But you were late. I wanted to get things right in heaven first. I wanted to see what the Father was doing. But I just didn't have the time. And you were running late and circumstances were happening. So I just did it myself and ran into battle. Now, here's what the word of the Lord is. And, and you'll find this in 1 Samuel 13. Yeah, it says. 
please stop this mess. And, and he runs into battle. This is what Samuel says to him. He said, Saul, if you had it honored God first, if you had have listened to what God had to say and, and, and got heaven right before you did stuff on earth, he said, you would have reigned over Israel forever. You would have been David. Literally, the Messianic line would have come through you. But because you chose not to get God on side first and not to actually follow God's instructions and be faithful to what God is calling, I'm going to take this thing off you and give it to a man more deserving. That's how important it is for us to start walking in this new reformation of hearing from God. Love the church. Come on Sundays. Be part of what God is doing. But this is just the filling station. It's the signpost. Don't fall in love with the signpost so much that you miss the destination of walking out your faith with Jesus amongst the Gentiles. So let's just compare it to the guy who got his job. David. David had been to battle. And he came back and the Amalekites had come and stolen his family and the family of his men, kidnapped a lot of them. Remember the story? Yeah. Yeah. Took a lot of them. So he comes back, all his tents are burned, his raiders have come, taken everything, his wives, his kids, everything. Take them away. Now, what would you have done, Peter? I'd have taken them back. You would have taken them back, right? <laughs> Chase them. Chase them down. Chase him down, right? Not what David did. Bring me the priest. And it says that the, his men were so angry with him, they were, get, they were about to stone him. He said, bring the priest. He goes before God. He said, God, an enemy's come, taken all our families, taken all our possessions, and just hid it away. What do you want me to do? Shall I chase him? Shall I hunt them down? He, he wouldn't even rescue his family without seeing in heaven first what God was about to do on earth. That's the guy who became the messianic line. I, I just think that, that uh, I, I'm just pretty excited that right now there's a reformation taking place in church. God's not overly concerned about how big your church is no. or how much of a mega star pastor you've got. <laughs> well, whether you worship, say, recording in the background or a full band, I don't think he's that interested. What he's interested in is, will you turn to the Gentiles? Will you have a faith-centered church and not a church-centered faith? Will you stop falling in love with the signpost and meet Jesus at the destination? Start to walk with him. Father, I pray this evening. Lord, I really pray this word is, is, is a revelation for, for this body. And already we've heard a prophetic word coming to this, this church, as people about who you're about to bring in and what you're about to do. And Lord, I've already understanding, talking to different people here, how much their heart is for the Gentiles and for the broken and the needy and the community around us and how they walked out and knocked on doors and looked for ways that they can serve people. But most of all, I pray that this church, this fellowship, will be built on a revelation of who Jesus is and what the Father is doing and, and seeing heaven first before walking it out on earth, by seeing the Father and, and his plan before running into battle. I pray that this would be a Jesus-centered church, a Jesus-centered people, a people that can see into the prophetic and walk out what you're doing, and that, Lord, it, it, would, it would be much more than the program and the activities inside the four walls. And it would be about a people living out the life of Jesus amongst Gentiles. Father, let your anointing rest upon this body. Lord, I pray for Peter and Sarah and their leadership team. Give them wisdom 
let them hear what the Father is doing. And Lord, if you're doing something different to every other church on the planet, let them have the courage to follow your voice, to follow your word. Lord, I pray for an anointing right across this auditorium right now. Lord, this, this, every person sitting here. I, I just believe this is a moment. I really do. I, right now, I pray for a supernatural impartation of grace, of gift, of anointing that will be activated in the marketplace. I pray for eyes that see what the Father is doing and hearts that are courageous enough to echo what they see on earth. I pray that we would genuinely live lives that said your will on earth as we see it in heaven. Lord, I pray for miracles in this church. But Lord, I just want to be bold enough today to pray that they would happen more and more outside the walls. I pray for Sunday services where people are rushing in. They're literally rushing in and grabbing the mic from Peter and Sarah. And son, I just got to tell you about the healing that took place at, at work on Saturday. I just want to tell you about the, the, the person who got saved, the street person who got saved on, on Friday night as I was walking the streets. And I just want to, I want to talk about the, 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 the person who served me at the restaurant and God gave me a word for them about their marriage and how he was going to restore it and how they broke down and cried and gave their life to Jesus. Lord, I pray that this would be an environment where people are so excited to talk about what's happening amongst the Gentiles and that we can rejoice as saints at what you're doing amongst sinners. Lord, I pray your favour and your blessing to be upon us in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you.